Fantastic. Um, that we will allow another half hour after the 90 minutes that we have um, that will focus on frugal and open innovation and are going to be taught by Gita um, from Copenhagen and Deborah from Paris, um, that we will allow another half an hour uh, in order to be able for you to sort of think again about what kind of teams you want to build, who you want to collaborate with. This is not mandatory. It is uh, an opportunity for you to just use the space and the time in order to you know, make up your minds around what kind of course projects you would want to work on um, for some groups potentially that are still looking for collaborators um, to sort of uh, pitch their ideas already and, and maybe activate other people to join them um, or the other way around for people to you know, share their interests um, and then see what kind of groups um, would fit, fit best um, for them. What we want to do for sure is uh, get a feedback from you um, by the beginning of next week uh, in what groups you want to work in, because next week uh, on Wednesday, our session is going to be dedicated to your group work. So we're going to build on the innovation inputs that we get from Gita and from Deborah um, and want to start working on your course projects where you're mainly going to work in the groups that you selected. Plus, uh, you will have uh, mentors from uh, the, the group of lecturers that are going to sort of switch between groups uh, and, and will help you um, discuss your ideas and develop your ideas around innovations that are addressing a sustainability challenge. So I think I've talked enough uh, now, um, unless there's any, any questions. Um, and uh, we'll hand it over to either Gita or Deborah. I'm not sure who, who the two of <laughs> Gita. <laughs> All right. So Gita first. Um, and then I think we can slowly get into the contents. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how many students there were. Last time we were 34 participants right now. I'm sure there are going to be a couple more um, dropping by. But uh, maybe we can slowly get into the content. So please, Gita, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kakroti. And... Uh... Welcome everyone. I've been looking very much forward to meeting you. Um, I know that you're a mixed group, uh, so it must be as exciting for you to meet each other as it is for me and the other um, teachers. Uh, I would like to encourage those of you who haven't already done it to turn on your camera, simply because it makes it uh, more fun for all of us to know that there are some real people out there. Um, and then I will jump into it by sharing my screen and the introductions to me and Deborah will come shortly. Um, let's see here. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, so um, as a general note, please uh, all of you feel free to uh, interrupt me and ask questions, should you have any. Uh, either you can raise the emoji hands that you all know very well by now, I'm sure, uh, or you can, un can unmute yourself and simply uh, speak into the microphone. All of it is completely fine with me. Um, today, as Georgie said, uh, you will be learning more about innovation. So I have the pleasure of introducing you to the uh, fundamentals you can say about innovation and innovation management. Uh, and then I will lead up to, so that will be roughly around one hour. And then I will lead up to Deborah, who will uh, then take over and talk to you about frugal innovation. Yeah. So um, the main learning outcomes of today is at this slide, meaning today of the innovation fundamentals. So that's what I will be talking to you about today. So in my part, I will briefly be talking to you about what is innovation and uh, why do we do it, or why would we want to do it. Um, then I want to take you through different uh, notions of innovation. You can say different phases, dimensions, approaches, levels, and degrees of innovation. So how can we understand this innovation phenomenon or phenomena? Um, and finally, I would like to go a bit meta with you uh, to discuss how we talk about innovation. So the way we actually talk about innovation, the framing of innovation, you can say, does it matter? How does that create certain implications uh, for the possibilities of, um, of, of pushing forward change initiatives or doing change, you can say, yeah? 
So that would be the themes that I will take you through before leaving the floor to Deborah. So who am I and, uh, and who is Deborah? Um, so my name is Gita, as you know now. Uh, I'm an uh, assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen, uh, where I mainly focus on innovation management uh, with a particular interest for open innovation or collaborative innovation. So what happens when multiple partners um, collaborate in the innovation process? What are the conflicts and tensions that can arise? Um, and then before uh, going into academia, I've, I've been working as a consultant, both in the private and the public sector, advising also on how to organize innovation processes. And in particular, I have also an interest um, in this context for gamification or what you might also have heard of as serious games and how we can use gamification as a catalyst for innovation and as a catalyst for learning about innovation. So that's briefly an introduction to myself. And then maybe Deborah, you want, you want to do it. <laughs> so hello everyone, my name is Debra Welevodka and I'm a professor at uh, Sorbonne University. I'm directing a um, um, master in uh, innovation management, so it's kind of my thing, innovation <laughs> management. But before that I was uh, more concerned about uh, consumer behavior and uh, now I'm, I'm trying to to study about the consumer behavior in an innovative uh, uh, environment. And um, especially on frugal innovation, which we're going to talk about after. So, Nagita, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so now we will start the exciting part. Um, so, basically, what I want from you, and I know it's a virtual setup, uh, and those that has its uh, pros and cons. Uh, so I would do my best to try to engage you a little bit and create some sort of interaction. Um, so I would like your opinions on why do we want to innovate? And either you can let me know by simply unmuting yourself, uh, or you can let me know by going into Mentimeter, where I made this setup. See if I can make it work. And if you let me know if you see this screen. Do you all see that? Yeah. So either you just unmute yourself, depending on uh, how brave you feel today. You're most welcome. Or you go to the um, website that you see on the top uh, where you have to press that code. So I don't know how many of you are familiar already with Mentimeter. But the smart thing here is that you use your mobile phone and then you you tap that code on your mobile phone, and then you simply put your answer on your mobile phone. Yeah. So in your pace, let me know why should we innovate at all? Why are we here? What are you doing in this session? Hmm? Don't be shy. Okay, so maybe uh, <clears throat> I, I can start. Yes. Uh, for me, innovation and why am I why am I here is all about uh, making a change, making something uh, better in a different way, uh, just to progress um, in in some kind of di direction. Let's say uh, I don't know this is what comes to my mind at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So to make things better. Uh, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Someone, yeah, it's also put into that to make things better, to make a better future. I think someone also put move forward or not repeat old habits. Uh, now there's some action going on there. I will try with the cognitive capacity that I have <laughs> to repeat what you what you write. Um, to improve saving time and costs, yeah. What could that also be if we think about um, organizations, for example? Why is innovation important for them? Yeah, competitive edge, exactly. That was what I was thinking of, competitive advantage. You also put society is evolving, future, 
the truth to is improve... just unmute on ourselves. If yeah. you want to say something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for me, innovation. Um, I think innovation is often mistaken as invention, mm -hmm. but I think it also includes process innovation. So optimizing the things we already have, not just processes, but also products. Mm -hmm. Not just coming up with new stuff, but also optimizing the things we already have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Optimizing the things you already have. So we could say that's also about serving needs better than we do, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, if if we take it... Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Um, I wanted to say just transformation, I think, is crucial for society, for business, for everyone. We're in constant transformation, making, as Roman said, everything better, like everything we can better. Mm -hmm. And just adapting to the changes we are, if we sell to the old ways, it's not only like how society has changed, the environment, uh, digiti digitization and digitalization. So mm -hmm. that's why it matters. Yeah, it matters. So maybe if we should go completely general on what I hear you saying, we could basically say it's about survival, right? Yeah. So many thanks. I will stop sharing. And all you, all very good points that you put in. I'll just go back to my slides for a moment here. Um, and I agree with you uh, with what you have been saying and what you have been writing. Let's see if I can like this, move it around. Um, so why do we innovate? Right, as you said, staying ahead of competition competitive edge, edge, you put that out there. Survival, as Daniela, I think it was just talked about in more like what does that imply, right? But it, it's it's important on a, you can say, for all of us on a very general level for the world, basically. Um, I don't know if it was Michael uh, who talked about serving needs better, uh, like it doesn't have to be creating something completely new, but it can just be improving on, on what we do. Can also be something new, right? But serving what the needs we have in a better way, making it easier to live, making it easier to work, and so on. Um, there was one element that I think you didn't mention. Uh, you could say it's, it's on a more basic level. I don't know, but it could also the answer could also be simply because it's fun, it's engaging, and it's motivating, right? Why do you want to innovate? It's fun. Could also be an answer. So my next question then. So now now we kind of established an idea about so why do we do it why do we spend one hour and a half sitting together now in this virtual room it's important for those and those reasons but then what is it then what is innovation actually so my so i think it was michael was it who, who, who touched upon it upon upon it before saying it could be something new it could be improvements can you elaborate on, on what is innovation for you? What does it imply when we, when we can call something innovation? What does it mean? I think innovation is also the exploitation of an invention. So that you mm -hmm. not just come up with something, but you also put it to market and uh, make use of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is completely correct. And now you're moving a bit ahead of my slides. So I'll get back to that point, which is correct. Um, if we take it a step backwards on a more basic, simple level, you could say, what is it? What is innovation? I would say that it is like an implementation of some idea to make mm, some product or something better or mm -hmm. change it a little bit mm -hmm. uh, in accordance of needs of the society or the particular person. Mm -hmm. Also correct, an implementation of some idea. So what is a critical aspect of innovation before we can call it an innovation? An idea, what does that imply? Maybe the creation of something new, like yes. by recombining um, like knowledge we already have to something new. Something new, exactly. Novelty. So... Um, so what does that mean? Something new, right? It has to be something that is different from its previous states. So that is a very basic point to innovation, something new. But then my next question would be, so what is it that has to be new? I believe it's, it can be anything that it's in some kind of change. 
and it's uh, passing the trends and uh, moving forward. It, it could be a product, it could be a term, it could be an idea, uh, whatever. It could be a product, definitely. So we could say it could be a technology. So a new yes, technology definitely. could be something new. Yeah. What else? Can it be the process about it? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, way how people are um, thinking about it? They yeah, exactly. So it could be like, uh, you could say the process, um, the, the way maybe the way we address our needs yes. could be new. Yeah. It could also be a very abstract concept, like, for example, an idea or a motivation like liberalism or democracy or something like that. See, that I would not call innovation necessarily. So we'll get back to that. So I'm, I'm happy that you're saying it um, because we'll have that on the next slides, right? So, um, so now if we say, okay, innovation, it has to be something new, different from its previous state, yeah? What is it that has to be new? It can be technology, new technology, or it could be our ways, the ways of addressing needs better, right? So my final question to you is then, to whom does it has to be new? New to whom? To the possible customers that are able to uh, take advantage from it. Mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. that can use it or for companies. Mm -hmm, definitely. So we could say it, had, it could be new to individuals, such as customers. It can be new to, you said, companies, so it can be new to organizations. I think it should be new nowadays to everyone because we have like a big information system like the internet. And if it's not new to anyone, or someone did it already. So uh, you can copy it and uh, maybe make some profits out of it. But if it's not new to everyone, um, someone, someone already did it. Correct. Someone already did it. Someone already did it. But it can be, for example, you can have an innovation that is new to one organization and it can be an innovation within that organization, but it might not be new. If I can comment another. on this. Yes. So um, I would say, for example, if you use a concept which already exists in one industry and you transfer to another industry where it wasn't used before, it's also innovation. For yes. example, like Airbnb did the yes. concept of these platforms already existed before, but they weren't used for sharing flats. Yes. Thanks for, um, thanks for sharing. So completely correct. But, but you're also correct, Roman, in the sense that it can be on many levels, right? So it can be new to individuals. It can be new to organizations. You can also have it new to an entire industry. And it can also be new to the entire world. That would be quite radical. Yeah? So, okay. Do, you're doing well. So recapping of our conversations here, we can say, what is innovation? So innovation is something new, different from its previous states. Uh, we can add to that, that that will always be subjective, meaning that the extent of innovation is socially constructed, right? When is something perceived as being new, that is subjective. Um, what is new? That can be technology. We could talk about the means and or it can be the way we address needs market needs, uh, user needs, so the ends, yeah? And to whom does it have to be new to? It could be the world, the industry, the organization, and the individual. Um, and then, and this is what some of you already touched upon, right, in our conversation so far. So would you say that an idea is an innovation? Simon is shaking his head. Yes, no, why not? Annika, yeah. Please um, go ahead. The, I think the idea itself is not an innovation yet. I think you need to commercialize it, then it becomes an innovation. Yes, you need to commercialize it. So, yeah. So that. So, what would you then reply to the next question? Is an invention an innovation? I would say uh, innovation is um, the com like making uh, an invention. Uh, making um, commercial use of an invention. 
Yeah, so you're completely, mm -hmm. all of you, on, on the same track here, and it's also completely correct what you're saying. Um, um, let's see, I had, so um, not all of you might already have, have, have learned about the whole commercial aspects of innovation. So just to, to put that more into, um, uh, or to make that idea more clear, um, or understanding more clear, I just want to share with you an example, or maybe Selina want to comment before. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to add something to this. So mm -hmm. I think to make an invention and innovation, you need to create a, a real product around it that uh, actually like customers can use so mm -hmm. that it doesn't only stay um, in the lab, in the science, but can be um, applicable to the real world. Yeah, so basically what all of you are saying, which is completely true, is that an idea is not innovation because it's not really materialized into anything, right? But although it's materialized like an invention, it's not an innovation either necessarily if it's not put into use, implemented or sold on the market. Yeah. So an example to kind of illustrate this, um, that person that I like very much um, is this one. What? That's an invention, ladies and gentlemen. What, what kind of invention do you think this is? You can see the inventors are named here. Um, trying to move your pictures. So it's a married couple, George and Charlotte Blonsky. Um, they have a patent on this great invention. What do you think it is? I think it looks like some sort of robot for doing surgery. It's not a robot, but it, you could say it might have something to do with surgery. Yeah. So can you see what, what, is, what is lying there? I can also help you a little bit with the next picture, if that makes it more visible. Like a poor person is lying on this thing. I would say a poor person. I would not like to be in that person's place. Is it some sort of like analytical device that like measures different things about the human? <laughs> no, um, no, no. So maybe if you look... Isn't she pregnant? Yes. It's oh, a Lord. pregnant woman. So what, what is... You can see the, the belly there on the, on the right hand side, right? There's a, there's a big belly. It's a pregnant woman. What is the pregnant woman doing there, you think? And here, if you go to the left hand side, there's kind of a net put in between her legs. What kind of machine would is you... It like a robot for giving birth? It's something, it's not like a robot. It's way before that. When was the, it patented in the 1960, 1965? It's like, um, yeah, what do they call it? An apparatus for facilitating the birth of a child by, hold your horses, centrifugal force. So these <clears throat> great inventors, they saw a real need in society, right? They wanted to serve needs better, which is, a good starting point for doing innovation. And I fully agree, mother of three kids, that um, it can be um, quite tough to give birth, right? And many people are doing it all the time. So how can we make this easier for the poor birth giving mothers out there in the world? And I assume this couple themselves might not have kids. So, but they came up with this um, idea thinking that centrifugal force, imagine that we strap this woman on a, I imagine it's a wooden made by, from wood, I don't know. I, that's what I imagine. We strap the lady on that one and then we just make it spin around, right? Very fast, like faster, faster, faster. In the end, centrifugal force will help so the baby will like be, how do you say it? <laughs> Thrown out of the mother's womb. And that could be devastating for a little child if a bang bangs into the wall, right? We don't want that to happen. So obviously they thought about that. So they put on like this little net that will catch the child flying, flying out, right? And then voila, no um, strained muscles from the side of the mother or whatever. And you just have a, like a happy baby lying in the net somewhere. And wait, um, for some reason, and I can personally see many reasons, uh, this invention was never sold on the market. So uh, this married couple thought that they had like a, a need they could really serve, help serve better. 
but they probably didn't do the testing of the idea very well, right? Because it turned out that in the real world, nobody really wanted to be part of that invention. So that's an example of an invention, which is not an innovation because it was never put into use. It was never sold on the market, as you always told me. So recapping, what is innovation? Uh, obviously, you already know there are multiple definitions of innovation. So these are the definitions I use. So the general definition uh, I use is that innovation is when needs or ends, you can say, and technology or means are combined in a novel, novel way. And the idea is introduced to the market, sold, or translated into implementation and use. The reason I say that is because it's not in every setting that an innovation is necessarily sold. For example, if we think about innovation in public organizations, you can have innovations that are put into use, but not sold on the market. So mostly when we talk about innovation, it's from an economic perspective, and the idea and the invention has to be sold on the market. But what is important is that for it to be called innovation, it has to be implemented or put into use. Yeah, that's a more general, general term of it. So relating to that, a definition of innovation is novelty in action. It's put into action, it's put into use. Um, innovation is socially constructed, meaning that the perception of something new is in the end socially constructed. Um, and also um, relating to that point is that innovations may or may not be successful, which is also an important point to remember because we have a tendency to have what we call a pro-innovation bias, right? Innovations are great, the end. Uh, that's not true. So innovation by definition is uncertain in both process and outcome, um, meaning that you might have an innovation, but we don't know the, the consequences of it may be unanticipated or unexpected. That's one point. Um, the other point is that innovations are subjective. So they're not inherently good or inherently bad they're not necessarily improvements for all, right? We might have innovations that work very well in the Western world, and uh, not so well outside the Western world, or in one organization, but not so well in another organization due to culture or habits or structure, whatever. Yeah? Any questions or comments? Then you just let me know. So don't wanna spend much time on this, Innovation versus invention, you got that completely um, spot on. Invention is the creation of a product or introduction of a process for the first time, creating something new, such as this horrifying birth giving machine. And an innovation is, as you said, the successful exploitation of new ideas. Um, it can be something that improves on or makes a significant contribution to an existing product, process or service. Doesn't have to be something completely new. Could be, doesn't have to be. Uh, so it's the use, the implementation of an idea or method. Yeah. Um, I see in the chat that, that I, I, I get some notifications in the chat. I will attend to those in the break. Um, so if I don't answer, just make me aware that I should attend to it now, right? So you don't, don't worry, I was, I was just sharing some information on them actually not having kids and uh, a short story in The Guardian that was quite nice about the Bronx Zoo and how it inspired them to come up with this invention. But th that was also, <laughs> that's just for reading after the class, I'd say. <laughs> so, you, so you have more context to the story? No, actually, I just, I just looked it up. I didn't, I didn't. Yeah, know. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rocky. Uh, but then I will still have a look at that in the break. So if you don't want to share it, then I'll... I'll uh... I will let people know what you found. Okay, so um, just taking the time. Yeah, uh, innovation is about identifying creating opportunities, new ways of serving existing markets, can be growing new markets, it can be rethinking services, meeting social needs, improving operations, doing what we do, but better. Just going back again. And just very quickly, because I know I'm, I'm limited in terms of time and you also need a break soon, but... Um, don't worry. <laughs> what? Don't worry. You take your time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Deborah. So why do you think I put a logo of Tesla when talking about innovation? And there are many reasons, so there are many answers to this question. I'm just curious for what you think when you see the Tesla logo. 
are they very successful in their innovation um, and have like a lot of funding and infrastructure for innovation within their company? So what would be an example of them doing innovation, you think? Um, they like motors and doing better car parts. I don't really know much about cars, um, mm-hmm. but like working on sort of electrical cars and that kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. So definitely you could talk about that there's innovation in terms of of new technologies? I think a very interesting part of te- uh, Tesla's innovation is the marketing because they don't spend a dollar on marketing. Mm-hmm. Just if Elon Musk twittering stuff and everyone is buying Teslas. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like mouth-to-mouth marketing and they don't advertise on the Super Bowl, they don't advertise on TV or anything. Uh, they just got it right um, with with their head figure, Elon Musk, um, being the saint of, of a brand. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. So you can say exactly. So, so that could be a, a marketing innovation. Yeah. What What else? Are there other types or dimensions, as I will call it later, dimensions of innovation that they're doing beyond technology or marketing innovation? They are pushing the economical market. Do in the in the way of uh, the cryptocurrency, especially. Okay, yeah. When- yeah, so that I don't even know much about. Can you elaborate a little bit on, on uh, how you see an innovation aspect, aspect there? I mean, they are trying to push the market uh, towards uh, accepting the multiple companies, the Dogecoin, because Dogecoin is very not very strong coin in the cryptocurrency. But uh, as I know, he really don't, likes it. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. So there might be some process innovation in terms of economic transi- transactions that they are adding to or something. Yeah, yeah. What about if I say business model innovation? Um, I, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I just want to say that because uh, I think Elon Musk is visioning that at some point nobody owns a car anymore, but it's just it's all car sharing. So you can, and whenever you need a Tesla, you just book one. Like we already have, for example, with um, like the BMW car sharing, but like everywhere in the world. Yeah, so that that could be a business model innovation, right? Um, also, yeah. Can I maybe add to that? Um, because mm-hmm. um, Tesla is, is is like a software company as much as it's a, a car company. So most of their cars sell very well because of their amazing uh, auto driving software. And also, they they don't have to do any hardware updates on that because they can just update the software and all the hardware is already in the car and they can sell the software. Like I think it's like 10,000 bucks for um, having the autopilot feature and they don't have to add anything to the car. Mm-hmm. So they can upsell their car basically with software. Mm, yeah, thanks. And uh, what about what about their patents? Do you know what they're doing with their patents? So now they made all these new technologies or software develop- developments and they have patents on that, obviously, right? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's true for all patents uh, of them, but um, of course, uh, what you uh, want to hear is that they, they offer other firms to, to also use them for free um, because they will want to foster the, the whole development of the EV market itself. Yeah, exactly. And what I also find to be interesting, because we were uh, talking about innovation and invention before, uh, what Tesla is doing with um, in 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 this these terms, because uh, when you look at other car companies, uh, they develop some ideas, develop them further, and then at the 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 end of the um, uh, the whole process, they present. Uh, a fully finished uh, sleek product uh, which has all the features and what uh, Tesla is doing often they did it with the Cybertruck which uh, they presented I don't know three years ago and which is not on the market yet uh, and uh, also with the solar panels that they have an idea and then they present it as it would be a product which already exists and then only uh, um, start to to uh, it's it's only an MVP essentially, and then only start to get funding for it and uh, uh, start developing it. So this is also uh, um, kind of innovative in terms of uh, how their funding works. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Kind of moonshot innovation, but but uh, that 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 they innovate in terms of yeah how, how they drive and get their funding before yes. they have something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also a good point. I'm very impressed by um, all of your your insights in relation to Tesla. I'm glad I asked for this example because whoa, <laughs> you know much more than I do. I like it. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so we kind of established why innovation is important, right? Um, but and also kind of touched on to whom it is important. So now I would just like you to to repeat that a little bit. Maybe the first one you already said it can be important for society, right? So for example, it can be an engine for economic growth. Um, just some facts in terms of <clears throat> how much uh, innovative products mattered for the German economy. Um, I'm not going into details with that now. Um, and a quote to back up my um, my comment that is an en engine for economic growth. So um, the UK Office of Science and Technology, for example, among others, write that innovation is the motor of the modern economy, turning ideas and knowledge into products and services, right? So it matters a lot for society in terms of, yeah, uh, resources and economic growth. Uh, as you say, companies, you also said that, right? Innovation helps you stay ahead of your competitions as markets, technologies, and trends shift. So innovation can be a key differentiator. Um, and again, I just put a quote from a, a Danish company that is all over the world. Um, uh, yeah, talking about why innovation matters for companies. So in addition to society and companies, who else would you say that innovation is important to? Before I move on to the next slide. The individuals who can make money out of it. The individuals, definitely, who can make money out of it, yeah. Uh, you can say individuals that can make money out of it, so it can be career enhancing, it can be the entrepreneurs. It can also be the users, right? It can make it easier or more fun to be a citizen or an employee or so on. Um, so what else in terms of companies, are there other organizations that innovation are important to? If I should give you a, yeah. Governments. Governments, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can say companies, obviously private organizations, right? But it's also important for public organizations. That could be governance. It could be municipalities. Um, so for a public organization, the same as a private organization goes. So uh, it can um, help you with more efficiency um, uh, with your resources. Uh, but for public organizations, also something else goes. Uh, so it's not only about the organizational performance. It's also about adapting to the changing needs and the aspirations of society. It's about improving the service to the public. So when I say it's not only about organizational performance, what I'm adding here is that um, it's, it's about adding to what is called public value. Yeah. So innovation for public organization is is adding to what the public, all of us, values and what add value to our public sphere. Yeah. And then as Roman, I think it was who said, finally, it can be important for individuals. Yeah. That can be employers, users, citizens, consumers, and also you as a person. Yeah. So just, I think, would you like a break or should we move on? If we move on, I'll tell you more pointers. In the end, if you have a break now, I might shorten it down a little bit, but I don't want you to be too tired in your head because then everything I say will sound like nonsense anyway, right? So um, break people, uh, raise your hands now. Yeah, yet too tired to respond. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for being honest there. So, but I will, I will be the mean one, right? I will be, I will, um, I will give you a break on three minutes. So you can stand up, shake your head, go have a coffee, go to the toilet, buy a break. No, five, five minutes, five minutes. So let's say uh, 16 minutes past four, and then I'll start again. A five minutes break. See you back soon. <laughs>
Gita, you're still I muted. am muted. Thanks, I just realized. So we're back. I hope you had the time to um, shake your head and arms a little bit. Um, FYI, that's uh, my break sign, the three that is broken. I found that funny when I was preparing the slides. So I wanted to just share that with you. Um, another thing I want to uh, talk to you about uh, when we go into what is innovation is obviously the innovation process. Yeah. And as you probably know, this has been conceptualized in many ways. So you might have been told that you have uh, three innovation phases. You might have read that there's four innovation phases. So there can be differences in the analytical frameworks, obviously, uh, that is being presented when we talk about innovation phases. I'm inspired by, by Hartley, uh, who has this um, process view of the innovation phase, or the innovation process. Um, she puts it into three phases. So first, there's the invention phase. Uh, I think in the chapter you read for today, uh, with Tit and Besant, they call it the searching and selecting stage. Uh, so this is, this is where we have the creativity. This is where the idea generation is going on. Yeah. So this phase is about recognizing the needs and the opportunities. And it's about inventing, finding or harvesting ideas. Yeah. Secondly, we have the implementation phase. So this is where you turn the ideas into concrete changes for an organization or into a service. So this phase is about making adjustments in shift from the idea to action, which we all learned now is critical for it to be called innovation in the first place, right? Uh, so in this second phase, what you do is you try to figure out how the idea um, will fit with the other organizational processes. For example, if it's something that should be implemented into an organization, yeah? And the final phase is the diffusion phase um, or the dissemination phase, you could say. So this is where you spread uh, the ideas uh, or the innovative practices over time. So this phase is about the exploitation of the idea. It's about the value capture. So you could say the first phase is about the value creation you create new ideas. This is where you need to capture the value from the idea. So for example, that, that's reflected in issues of intellectual property, patents. That's one way to capture the value by saying, if you want to use my idea, you need to either pay me a license or you buy my patents or so on and so forth. There are many ways to craft that. Um, when we talk about public organizations, uh, it's a bit different. It can be a bit different than private organizations. I know this varies also obviously from country to country, right? Uh, but it can be different from private organizations because normally public organization has an imperative of sharing uh, innovations in the public sector. Hence the notion I talked about before about adding to public value. Um, yeah, so adding to public value and, and reducing uh, risks. Did someone want to ask a question? No, okay. So the core of innovation is important to understand that it's about creating value and equally about capturing value. Yeah. Uh, so if we take like an economic perspective, we can say, as you already said yourself to me, uh, inventions do not necessarily lead to technical innovations. In fact, the majority do not. Uh, so an innovation in the economic sense is accomplished only with the first commercial transaction. Yeah. Uh, we can also talk about business models, and you will be learning about business models later in the course, I know. So the business model unlocks latent value from a technology. A business model describes how an organization creates, delivers, and captures value, um, which leads me to open innovation as a certain form of business model, where it's a business model that utilizes both external and internal ideas to create value while defining internal mechanisms to claim a portion of that value. And don't worry, I will go a little bit into what I mean by that um, now. Yeah. Uh, just want to make an important point also that when I talk about value, it's not limited to monetary value. So value can also be satisfaction or status or convenience. Yeah. So open innovation. How many of you uh, heard about open innovation? Um, Raise of hands. One, two. 
three, four, five. Yeah, so some of you, not too many. Um, so basically, open innovation um, is focused on involving external stakeholders into the innovation process for various reasons. So a main reason is to grow the resource base, um, get more brains, right, to come up with new and better ideas, um, to create better value, to create a better service experience. Um, create better value can, for example, be that we ask the users of our products. Um, I'll come to that in a moment. Third bullet point, it can also be to overcome local search bias. So get to know what we don't know. Um, so we all had a, have a search bias, right? And if you get wild cards or people from outside an organization, for example, it can challenge those, bi those biases and make you think in a new way, yeah? Uh, create better value and the service experience relates to that um, involving external stakeholders into the innovation process makes it possible to combine, you can say, um, solution or expert knowledge with actual needs. So what do I mean by that? For example, Coloplast, which some of you might know, it's a Danish company um, that, among other things, designs uh, estomy bags. Um, and they're quite famous for involving the users uh, in the process of designing these bags. So instead of having um, technical experts sitting in an internal R&D development uh, with all the technical expertise trying to come up with how should we design the best estomy bags. The idea here is that we ask the users of those estomy bags, right? Because end of the day, they're the ones who might come up uh, with real issues that an expert can never think of. For example, I was um, once attending one of their uh, online user communities at Coloplast where you had users writing in that, okay, when you have uh, when you use an estomy bag, you might have issues if you have uh, air in the stomach. You need to release that air without at least releasing what might else be in that bag, right? And that's a very specific concrete issue that as an internal R&D specialist, you might be very well educated into technicalities about designing an estomy bag, uh, but you might not have a clue about this issue because you never wore it yourself. Right? So that's an example of how external resources can add to the, um, to the knowledge needed to develop successful products or serving needs better. Yeah? Um, those of you who raised your hand, you might uh, already have seen this model. So open innovation basically is a term coined by Chesbro um, around 2003, I would say, with his seminal book. Um, and he came up with this model also. Um, so uh, showing, <clears throat> so these, um, I don't know if you can see my arrow on the screen. Can you see my arrow on the screen? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so so uh, these pointers are, are stippled liners indicating the firm boundary. So a, in a traditional innovation model, this would be solid line, you would say, where you have the whole innovation process going on internally in the in, in, inside the firm. So with the open innovation model, um, you have, uh, as it says here, open innovation refers to an innovation model that emphasizes purposive inflows and outflows of knowledge across the boundary of a firm in order to leverage external sources of knowledge and commercialization path. Yeah, so it might be in the invention part of the innovation process where you use external knowledge bases to come up with better ideas. It might also be later in the innovation process uh, where you have suppliers uh, or where you have people commercializing uh, your innovation outside. Um, uh, yeah, so finding new commercial commercialization path. Um, Yeah, I think that's basically what I wanted to say with that picture. So just uh, what might be in, uh, relevant to know is, as I said, open innovation is a term coined by Chesbro. Um, and that's basically used when you talk about innovation in the, in the private sector. Uh, but if you go and look into innovation in the public sector, you might see, or if you read about it, you might see that the term of collaborative innovation is used more. 
So there might not be the big differences between open innovation and collaborative innovation. It's more a matter of the scholars that use the terminology that are, when it comes to open innovation, more firm-centric than when it comes to collaborative innovation. Just if you were wondering about that. Um, this is a table from a reference I put for you as uh, non-obligatory, but you might find it interesting to read about uh, what is the differences between open innovation and a traditional innovation model. Um, so just to quickly flag some pointers, as I said, when it comes to the traditional innovation model, the, the invention part of the innovation process is, is done by, by domain experts um, who knows about the topic, or who knows about this technology. So, so, right? When it comes to an open innovation model, this can basically be anyone. Uh, they can be anonymous, they can be amateurs. For example, you might uh, know of crowdsourcing. So where you have an, an open platform um, and then firms can post problems that they're looking, searching for solutions for those problems. And anyone can add to come up with that idea uh, on this platform. Yeah. Um, so that also means that the type of process oftentimes when it comes to open innovation um, can be a virtual process uh, yeah, with light communication and interaction. Uh, and also when it comes to the spatial dimension with a traditional innovation model, it's geographically concentrated in one or few locations. And when it comes to open innovation, it can be all over the world, right? Being virtual. Uh, and when it comes to time, then instead of long R&D cycles, you have much shorter R&D cycles when it comes to open innovation um, processes. Yeah, You can read more about that in, in the reference uh, that you'll find on the website if you're interested. Going back to innovation, and I know Deborah will also, when she talks about frugal innovation, that build also on this notion of open innovation more. Yeah, um, Before that, I want you to, um, and, and I know some of you already, already mentioned these differences between different dimensions of innovation. So I want to just reflect a little bit on that with you. Um, so an innovation can hold many dimensions. I will introduce you briefly to four key dimensions, which is product innovations, process innovations. You already mentioned those two, yeah? In addition to that, we can add service innovation and business model innovation. We also talked about that a little bit. In the public sector, we can also have policy innovation, governance innovation, rhetorical innovation. I think it was, was it Simon or Michael? I don't remember. Someone talked about marketing innovation. So you have multiple other dimensions to innovation. Uh, and now we will just focus on the first four dimensions. Yeah. Um, I choose to call it dimensions, uh, again, with a reference to Hartley, um, to make the point that any innovation may involve more than one dimension. So she says, for example, there are a number of typologies of innovation, but I argue that it is more helpful to conceptualize innovation as dimensions rather than types because any innovation may involve more than one type. So basically don't get too confused about the terminology here. The point being, um, as you will discuss, that one innovation can hold multiple dimensions. Yeah, we talked about it with Tesla. You mentioned multiple dimensions when we had that example. So a product innovation, that's a new physical artifact implemented in the market often visible to customers and to users. So give me some examples. I know you can do that quickly. What would be an example of product innovation? You can just shout it out or put it in the chat and I'll leave it open. The iPhone. Sorry? The iPhone. The iPhone, yeah. Classic example, the iPhone. Um, other classic examples could be um, the robot nurse, Pepper. Uh, it could be the, oh, I always forget the name of that. Is it called CT scanner? Nah, you know where you, you know what it is, this huge machine or the earring help, right? Classic product innovations. Then moving on to process innovation. So a process innovation, 
as compared to a product manager. A process innovation is a novel combination of factors which enable a particular good or task to be produced more cost effectively, effectively to a higher standard, uh, more safely and or quicker. And in contrast to a product innovation, process innovations are only seen internally in an organization or in a project. So what would be an example of a process innovation? Maybe the storage concept from Amazon, because they store um, uh, goods in different, uh, different goods which differ with different sizes together to save space. And uh, that's how they uh, were able to um, offer them um, more cheap than other uh, the, the competition. Yeah, good point. Yeah, definitely. I think that could be yeah an example. Also of the, the, the division of work um, and the manufacturing line introduced by Henry Ford. Exactly. That's a, a complete classic when you when you talk about process innovation. It's the Henry Ford's assembly line. Yeah. Any others? Maybe maybe the outsourcing. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit? Yeah, like the the idea of outsourcing and uh, putting the different part of the uh, of the job to the different uh, countries and different companies, yeah. Uh, yeah. just yeah. to save money and, and things. Yeah. yeah, so work processes, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 or lines like op open innovation could be a process innovation in that aspect potentially. Yeah, um, I also put as uh, someone said, I didn't see the name here on my screen, but Henry Ford's assembly line, you see that in the upper right corner, could also be the process of washing hands, right? That was a very critical process innovation. Um, so if we want to stay within the theme of giving birth, then in the very old days, um, it was not too great to be a woman that had to give birth in a hospital because uh, typically you would die from it because what happened would be that the uh, doctors would uh, would would dissect uh, some dead body somewhere where they would have like a whole auditorium with people educating like here you have like a whatever inside the body of this dead person and then they would go directly into the next room and conceive a baby um, and the result of that would be that the woman would typically get an infection that she would die from. Uh, and nobody really knew why all these women, why it, why it was so deadly to give birth at hospitals, right? Until I think actually a German doctor from Vienna or something wrote the Danish government. Uh, I don't know why, but we found out that if we wash our hands, this um, mortality rate really um, decreases. And obviously the Danes said that's so... Uh, Uh, n there's no evidence. That's so non-research-based based nonsense. We're not listening to that. Shame on you. Never talking to that German freak again. So the Danes kept going on with their deadly procedures until years after they had to realize that actually there was something about the talk, right? Yeah, process innovation. So uh, we also have service innovations. So compared to, in contrast to a product innovation, service innovations are intangible. Um, also, they are produced and consumed simultaneously and together with the customer and user, right? So when you have a product, you produce the product, you sell it on the market where it's consumed. When you have a service innovation, the consuming of the product is the service. So the users are part of consuming the product while it is being produced as a service, yeah? Also in a service innovation, the user experience is of primary value. So... Value is co-created, so the users are not just uh, a consumer buying a product, but the user are a resource that is actually creating the value of that service while it is being caught out or, or carried out. So any examples of a service innovation that you can share? Spotify. Spotify, yeah. Can you elaborate on, on how that is a service innovation? Yeah, before the big streaming, uh, music streaming services, uh, everyone had to download their own songs. And um, yeah, now everyone can just stream them online without the need to download them and find them. And you can find playlists of other people. So uh, a whole mm -hmm. lot of services that have, mm -hmm. uh, have yeah. not been there before. 
Yeah, I, so I agree. It's a, it's a service innovation. It could also be, so that's come, it comes very close to a process innovation. Um, and why, what might be a bit borderline with that example is that um, maybe the level of involvement from the users is not too high. I don't know if you can think of other examples where the user involvement, where the user is co-creating the service. Obviously, this is not only to Roman, but to all of you, Christian. I would say this is like nowadays really common for UX and UI design in general. They are doing this in most uh, companies where they are uh, trying to find the, um, let's say, technical product for the customer. They are asking him what he wants, and then they are trying the, to implement it by asking the users how they, are, how they want to have the product. So yeah. it's the so, general field in nowadays, uh, I would say, uh, technology. So that would be, yes, yeah, so I agree. So, so in general, there's a trend of user involvement. Yeah, it, for oh, example, yeah. like web pages or, or I don't know, any other applications that, uh, that, the cost, that, that the customer wants to have. Yeah. Maybe also social media, because everything you consume on social media is basically created by users. Yeah. So I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, car sharing, it's, it's car as a service. So mm -hmm. it would fit the category of a service, but the concept of car sharing is more of a process. But at the same time, in the case, for example, of BMW, it's an innovative business model. Mm -hmm. So car sharing, Airbnb. Mm. That's an innovation that fits then several dimensions, not just one, right? Exactly, I agree. I would say car sharing could both be process, service, and business model innovation. Mm -hmm. So definitely business model, as you say, and process, but also service because you also uh, the users are part of co-creating the value by being part of, 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 of the process and finding the cars or sharing the cars or um, Airbnb likewise, both, right? Yeah. Uh, so I, I put the examples I put was, um, I know that many of you are Germans, I think. So you, I don't know, you, you might have been in the Munich airport. I think uh, this picture to the left is from Munich airport. So um, <clears throat> main, uh, um, how do you say, um, uh, uh, actors that have really pushed forward and, and, um, and front leaders of service innovations um, are airports and hotel the hotel industry, um, obviously, because there's been a lot of focus on, on, the, on the service customers there, right, in these industries. So, for example, airports have been trying to innovate in terms of just thinking about the process of traveling from A to B. Um, you might have, they might have um, many customers that are afraid of flying, for example. Uh, so how can they improve of not, not just being a matter of traveling from A to B, but actually enjoying or creating value in the process. Yeah. So you, you find many airports that, for example, in the case of the Munich airport, put up um, uh, surfing waves and surfing competitions. So while you wait for your plane, you can go and, uh, and, and be part of, um, of, of a surfing competition, basically. You also find like a yoga mats or uh, massage chairs, or I think it's Kuala Lumpur that has a rainforest. You can go have a look in, and, and all these are elements of service innovations in the airports, trying to improve the service experience from, um, uh, yeah, for, for their customers. You also see the self check in desks. You could also call that a service innovation. So instead of uh, in the old days, uh, there was the assumption that the best service is uh, someone performing it for you. So you will have long lines of queuing where you had to do your check-in. Um, and then by doing tests and observations in the airport, they realized that actually customers preferred to be in control of the self-check-in plus the reduction of the queues, right? They could do it themselves. So actually doing it themselves was a better service value than having someone doing it for you. Um, and and uh, I put the picture of the hotels because one of the service innovations that are uh, famous within the hotel industry is that they changed from having their focus uh, on the receptionist greeting you when you entered from a long travel, right? You would enter a hotel and they would say, 
welcome, welcome. How was your travel? And start chatting to you and making you feel very welcome in the hotel. Uh, but then they realized after interviewing observations or, yeah, uh, examining their customer groups better, they realized that actually most travelers are very tired when they arrive to a hotel, right? not being in the mood for chit chat. Basically just want to go to your room and relax. Right? So what happened in the hotel is that they changed the focus from being the receptionist, like one big happy smile, she's still smiling obviously, but not having too much focus on that greeting, but instead putting the focus into the rooms where you will find a little chocolate or welcome note or like the towels formed like a swan. Yeah. So that could also be an example of a service innovation. So finally, business model innovations. Uh, that is um, a new overall business formula. So the, um, <clears throat> in the, the change of how to generate and capture value and how to interact with your stakeholders. So I think it was Daniela who always gave, already gave the examples of Airbnb. Uh, she said car sharing, it could also be Uber. And you already yourself also came up with the examples of Tesla that have done business model innovations. Yeah. So take just two minutes, uh, not two minutes, that's too long, but take a little while to think of an innovation, including multiple dimensions. Again, Dan Daniela already mentioned one. I would just like some of you to mention another one or two more. So just think of what could be an innovation that has multiple dimensions to it. Hmm? And just speak out when you, if you have any suggestions. I would say that grocery stores. How, how so the grocery stores? Yeah, like for example, they have most of the time this innovation, like also the self check in, self checkout. Mm -hmm. And definitely how they are selling their products, how to provide them, you know, like better sellings, like per. Like, for example, that first what you can see is, I don't know, uh, chocolate or if it is like uh, first when you came into the shopping, like it is uh, toilet paper or this kind of stuff that they are very focused on what you are seeing at the first and how you are going uh, through the shop. Then yeah. I would say definitely also how they are uh, distributing, for example. Uh, nowadays, there are a lot of like uh, you can just... Uh, check like online shop and they can deliver it to you yeah yeah so yeah so that's so that's different innovations you mentioned right so for example if we stick to like the self-check-in we could say that could both be a process and a service innovation for example and 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 as you say but but the way they interact with the customers for example virtual shopping uh, could also be service innovation and business model innovation because it's new ways of interacting with the customers yeah so the, just to just to uh, yeah 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 take up some of some of the examples you gave yeah thanks any other comments yeah I would also give one example I think um, back then when uh, Skype for example came up I don't know if it's the first one but I think this like um, video chat because it's first of all um, a service innovation because um, the users can then more easily do the video chat via laptop or phone. And um, also it's a different business model innovation because maybe previously when you use your phone, you have a contract with your, um, yeah, with your um, provider, but um, now with Skype, you can either use it for free or you have a premium account which charges you some money so it's more mm. subscription based mm. yeah yeah thanks i agree um and just as, as you as you might also uh, think uh when you when you um, when you listen to my dimensions is that it can be maybe that it can be a bit hard to distinguish sometimes between process and service innovation so what i think is important to remember to how service innovation distinguishes from process innovations um is this focus on the on the user as a co-creator of value. So, so having the user being part of creating the value, 
by 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 being an active part of creating the value. That that that's a good rule of thumb to have in mind. But it is a bit of a gray zone area, right? What does it actually mean to interact with the users to what degree and stuff? Um, but but a process innovation doesn't have to have a focus on the user that has a primary value. It could just be like the four to simple line, right? Um, just wanted to yeah put that point. But thanks for your good examples. There's one more person, Peter Selina. I think. Ah, no, I think it, <laughs> is it is it um, just because you didn't take down your hand, or do you have Sorry. more to add? Um, yeah, I just wanted to give another example, but um, yeah, there was uh, plenty already. No, but please, please do. If you have a good example, we would like to hear it. Or for later. Sorry, my my internet is unstable. I, I didn't hear what you said last. <laughs> I just said, please do share your example. If you oh, have sorry. Example. Okay. Yeah. So actually. Yeah, now I'm a little bit unsure whether it fits multiple dimensions or because of what you just said. But I was thinking of the mobile banking apps because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think they change the service the, the banks are giving to the customers. Like, I don't know, I think even it, it has an impact on how, um, how, many, uh, how much stuff a, a bank needs to attend because yeah. there's a lot of automation. Yeah. And uh, customers simply access um, yeah, a lot of their personal um, bank statements yeah, directly. Uh, and also it, it changes. Yeah, that's why I'm not quite sure. But it also, of course, changes like the way um, customers see their banks and yeah. Yeah, how they um, yeah, get in touch and interact. Like they don't go to um, offices as much anymore as they, they did maybe 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, so what dimensions would you say that example holds? Yeah, it, I thought um, that it holds the service and the process dimension. Yeah, and, and maybe even also the business model, right? Like being being new ways of of uh, yeah, you could, being new ways of interacting uh, with with customers or uh, or um, how do you say? Um, yeah, a, more, a better use of, of uh, the internal resources. Yeah, also maybe I can uh, uh, give some information in addition. N26, for example, they also sell um, uh, like premium features in the app where you uh, um, can better have an overview about your spending and so on. There's uh, uh, extra features and they sell it uh, with uh, the the account model you choose, so uh, you also have the business innovation. Yeah, uh, good point. This good side. point. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Business model there. Good point. Yeah, Julia, can it, can it is, is it a short one? Uh, yes, uh, maybe it's not uh, really answer to this question, but uh, con connecting to banking, uh, I just came up with the idea about the uh, Brick. Maybe you don't know because it's uh, the tool in Poland which we have. And it works that we don't need to pay, but traditional transfer, or we don't need to, you know, add our payment card. Uh, we just have a code in uh, in app, and we can confirm uh, the transfer by that, or we can uh, make a really quick uh, transfer by a phone number, etc. So I think that's really a nice uh, uh, innovation. So yeah. and it's. Uh, good to say about that tool, but it's unfortunately only uh, in Poland. Yeah, no, but thanks. Yeah, also a good example. Okay, so the, so um, many thanks for to all of you. Um, moving on, the last framework I want to present to you is, um, is just this understanding that now we talked about different dimensions to innovation, but obviously we also have different levels and degrees of innovation. Yeah, so what I mean by that is that you can have <clears throat> improvements to components, component level, uh, and you can have uh, improvements on a system level. And you might have compatibility issues here, right? So, for example, if you, uh, the, how do you call it, the CD, the CD, I, I forgot the full name, <laughs> but the compact disc, yeah? Uh, so you can have the compact disc and it needs to, that product needs to fit in a in a um, in the in the player the disc player right or you can say the Airbus 380 um, needs to fit in a bigger 
infrastructure of the airports because it's such a huge um, airplane, the airplane 680, sorry, the airbus. Um, and um, and then you have degrees of innovation. So we can we can range from incremental innovation, doing what we do but better, to radical innovations, new to the world. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and 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 then up here. Uh, where we have innovations on a system level that are radical innovations, this is typically where we'll see the sustainability transition, trans transitions happening here, right? Because radical changes at a system level uh, are needed to address what you heard briefly about in the introduction section. So needed to address grand challenges or wicked problems such as climate crisis and so on, right? It's not, to not, it's not enough to be down here. You need to have very radical changes on a system level. Um, so this framework can help you orient yourself in terms of um, where to change and the scope of the change. Yeah, uh, we don't really have time for a break, um, and uh, I just wanted to ask Deborah um, <laughs> if if uh, <laughs> now I'm 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 putting you putting you into the virtual space, Debra. If you would like to talk about frugal innovation now, and then I put up a video on the framing of innovation. I think have you reflect on this meter or why? I think it's, it's better for you to finish because um, eight minutes, it's quite not enough to talk about frugal innovation. And uh, I cannot stay uh, after 5 okay. p.m. So maybe you finish and I will put a video on frugal innovation that uh, the student will have to watch. I will put it tomorrow uh, on the website and then the student will have to watch it to do the assignment for the next week, if it's okay for everyone. I think we can we can do it that way um, if we have the video and then maybe Deborah for the next session you could also use a couple of minutes at the beginning yeah, yeah, know, to make 15 a... or 20 minutes to just reflect on that so that we get back into into sort of working mode and after that we can break up into the groups and and then start thinking in the groups around uh, you yeah. know what kind of innovations you would want to push um, and and what your initial ideas would be. I think okay. that would be the best way. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's better to 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 make a video so that uh, they can begin to think about frugality in their innovations. Thanks. Okay, okay so Gita, go on. I will I will then just take you uh, before you are done with me. Uh, I will take you a bit on a on a meta level. So we go in the helicopter now. Uh, because I just want you to reflect on now we had all this great talk about innovation, um, but are there potential problems in actually calling change initiatives innovation the way we do? Yeah. Um, so the paper that you might have read uh, for today, um, that and also another one that I put as a, if you want to, non-obligatory read, uh, they, they show and argue that the way we, we call change initiatives innovation gives us a license to deviate from standard solutions and search for new solutions. Yeah, so we need something new, right? It needs to be new. But not only new, it needs to be new in a specific way. So often innovation is described as an intentional effect to improve a specific task, product, and enhance the value. That implies, first of all, that the problem we're trying to solve is very complex and shared. That's, for example, the case when we talk about wicked problems and grand challenges. It's a shared problem. We cannot solve it in our country. It cross boundary, right? It's very complex. We need multiple brains. So multiple brains are needed. That's why we call for interdisciplinary and interorganizational collaboration. So you probably noticed more and more when we talk about innovation processes, it has to be together with as many actors as possible. Yeah. You also see it in the sustainable development goals that you saw last time, I think it's number 17, that explicitly stretches we need partnerships when we talk about innovation, yeah? Uh, it also implies, the way we talk about innovation, implies that we believe that there has to be a high degree of openness to stimulate creativity. For example, we use brainstorming tools. Uh, and, uh, and then Silas and Mayer argue that there's a Western world bias. So the way we talk about innovation, what when we call change in its serious innovation, we have a Western world bias of what that implies and means. Um, just quick definition of what do I mean when I say the framing of innovation. So framing 
What I mean here is a set of concepts and theoretical perspectives on how individuals, groups, and societies organize, perceive, and communicate about reality. Yeah. So when we talk about innovation, we have implicitly distinct ways of perceiving the problems we're trying to solve and the possible solutions and path of inquiry. Hmm? These distinct ways has performative effects, meaning they encourage us to do collaborations, they encourage us to do partnerships, and they encourage a belief in that the problems we're solving are complex and shared. They also encourage quick and radical changes versus, for example, routines and predictable improvements. That's not really innovative, right? Routines, bah. Um, Point. Third bullet here is, um, I just want to give you some examples of innovations that are being encouraged and framed in certain ways and see if you agree, right? So for example, I assume you heard this a lot, disruption. Uh, so disrupt in the name of innovation. Disruption brings endless opportunities. In Denmark, the government even set down a disruption council as a new partnership for Denmark's future, right? So would you say that there's any problems when we understand innovation as disruptions? Could there be any problems to this way of framing innovation, you'd say? Um, yeah, I think then if we think innovation can only be a disruption, then we might ignore smaller innovations which are more inc incremental. It's true, exactly. So the routines that are actually working or improvements to that might be ignored. It, yeah, ignored. What else might be issues when talking about innovation as disruptions? I think Selina came first. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think um, also maybe if you frame uh, innovation as disruption, um, people that have ideas for small changes think they are not worth um, the, the trouble. So maybe small innovations that can also give a lot of benefit to customers or to users um, could be ignored because they're not big enough to um, be seen by the public. Mm -hmm, true. Daniela also put up your hand. Yeah. If it's a disruption, you think of something completely new out of the box, but an innovation could be just tweaking a little bit of process that it makes it better. Um, yeah. The improvement would be dismissed. So what about, so how, how, how could this be an issue when we talk about sustainability, for example, if everything has to be disruptions? So I'm thinking if we have to, now we talk about limited resources in the world, right? And if we think about innovation as something where we have to come up with new technologies, for example, or new developments all the time, what happens to the whole idea of maintenance? So using existing resources and ways of yeah. optimization is also neglected, which would like save on resources. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that could be one uh, potential uh, issue or performative or unante unanticipated effect of talk about innovations the way we do, right? Uh, I also put this one, that's a picture of the innovation funds uh, we have in Denmark that funds research. Uh, so if you do research within innovation, such as what I do, uh, I can apply for money at the innovation fund. But the thing is they have a very distinct definition of what innovation is. So for the innovation foundation, uh, innovation is high tech or hardware. So new technologies, uh, and that's basically it. And, uh, and, and the problems of defining innovation like that is, for example, that uh, methods are not being see seen as innovations. So all the research in Denmark that is being done on innovation methods or procedures or processes cannot really get funding from the Innovation Fund. But what researchers need to get is money, right, to do research. So what happens in the landscape in Denmark, for example, is that you see innovation research uh, redoing their focus on where the money is. So suddenly you're changing the knowledge we have on innovation, obviously in regard to the political decision of where you want to put in money. But because of the definition of how you define innovation, it, it creates a very distinct research focus that leaves other focuses out, right? Which again can have quite unanticipated effects 
on the innovation in society, I would argue. So wrapping up, the points I want you to uh, take with you from this meta reflection is that, first of all, we should not assume that intentions to innovate will by themselves enhance creativity and innovation. Second, unintended and unanticipated consequences of framing change initiatives as innovation might occur, such as that if we only see disruptions, we might neglect the relevance of maintenance. Also, on that note, be aware of pro-innovation bias. So as I started out by saying, innovation is not good per se. It can be good for some, but bad for others due to different organizational context, different external factors. And that is it. So any questions or comments before um, I will leave the, the floor to Rocky? You're of course always welcome to, uh, to write questions or thoughts or comments if they arise on a later stage. I don't know if you can that on can do that on the website. Also, feel free to email me. Um, but then I just want to end by by thanking you for your engagement and activity uh, and and very good examples and thoughts and reflections. Um, I enjoyed that very much, and uh, I'm looking forward to the further process of this uh, course. Um, yeah, and. Um, Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Gita. So, uh, as Gita just said, if anyone still has questions, feel, please feel free um, to put them up or to to bring them up, and we can discuss them. What I think uh, you actually uh, sort of initiated quite nicely, Gita, is this also this challenge of you know, do we always uh, need high tech, for instance, as innovation? And that's this very nice, I think, transition towards. Deborah's focus on frugal innovation, which is actually quite the opposite, right? So really tuning down on high tech and, and doing things completely anew. And instead, maybe thinking about the small tweaks and changes um, that can, uh, you know, improve the situation uh, much more than, um, than, than high tech um, sometimes can, right? Uh, Deborah, if you, if you wanted to, to build on that, please, please feel free because you're mute yourself, I think. Um, no, I'm not, but <laughs> okay. uh, I just, uh, I just drop an, uh, um, a message for everyone um, so that uh, you can uh, see the, the video on tomorrow on frugal innovation. And uh, maybe you can take the week to think about the assignment at the end of the video. I will, uh, we, Gita and I, and I will give you. Um, which consists in giving, uh, in thinking about frugality and what it, what does it mean and how it can uh, be used in uh, your innovation projects. So I cannot say more because uh, you didn't watch the video and we didn't talk about frugality, but uh, you will see that it's uh, quite a, a simple and clever way to, to innovate. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, thanks, everyone, for being uh, being so flexible. As you see, this is really a bit of an experiment here as well, bringing a, a group of lecturers together and, and bringing the, the, bit, the bits and pieces that we that we all want to see and that are going to inform your course projects. Um, so I think we're going into a little bit of experimentation here as well and uh, working together. So what we're going to do next week, uh, as we already said, is uh, use a couple of minutes to sort of do a recap and get really into the frugality parts. And then we're going to use uh, most of that session in order to promote um, the work and your thinking around your innovation projects. And we are going to build those step by step with giving you a couple of inputs first and then having these working sessions, uh, which, which I'm sure um, you've already been uh, explained in the first session. But I think um, that's important to keep in mind that we that we have some flexibility here, that we're also embracing experimentation and that we also want to go by your ideas. Right. So it really depends also on, you know, what you can imagine, what you're bringing together, what you want to promote, be it, you know, some kind of a hypothetical example of really even working with existing organizations. So we're really open in terms of what you're going to do for your assignment and for your course projects. Um, so I think uh, that's something of um, and as I said, an experiment, maybe an innovation that we're going into, right? So thanks very much, Gita, uh, and also Deborah for then uh, taking up the ball. Um, what I would suggest now, Gita, is if you just stop the sharing, we will still give everyone the opportunity to, you know, just use this for a little bit of networking and for a little bit of 
you know, if there are groups that are still looking for collaborators, if they wanted to pitch their ideas, or if there are individuals who have some, some kind of an idea around innovation and sustainability and would like to, you know, gather in a group, we just want to, you know, present you with this forum, right? If you say, I don't need it, you're very free to, you know, just, just leave now and we're going to see you next week. And otherwise, if you really want to use the time to have a brief exchange and get a sense of, you know, who's in the room. I think you did that already last week, but still, you know, what are the interests that are sort of driving you and what could you be working on? That would be fantastic. Um So hello everyone, um, I will uh, now talk about um, frugal innovation, which um, I didn't do yesterday. Uh, so my name is still Debra and I'm a professor at Sorbonne University and I'm uh, directing a Master of uh, Innovation Management. Uh, first, uh, I, I would have liked to uh, ask you about what about frugality, about your definition of something frugal, of what is frugality, and an example of uh, frugal innovation. So uh, it, it's not possible on video, but uh, take a little time, uh, maybe make pause or I don't know, to think about that, that um, to think about your own knowledge about frugality. And uh, maybe to think about uh, an in a frugal innovation that you have uh, learned about or hear about uh, these days. So uh, together we're going to talk about frugal innovation uh, and about uh, JUGAD, which is the Indian term for, uh, for the very innovative and uh, very simple idea. Um, in fact, companies... Uh, may choose a radically different growth path uh, in order to improve their sustainability, to respect the environment, to improve diversity, inclusivity. Uh, but also to be clear, frugal doesn't mean um, doesn't mean be good. Uh, you know, it's not mean it, it doesn't mean nice. Uh, frugal is uh, also to win more money uh, because it's also to catch more customers. So. Um, uh, it seems to be simple to be frugal, but not all companies can afford uh, frugality, paradoxically. Uh, some of them try, but they only succeed in greenwashing their activities. Frugality is a concept, is the heart of the heart, heart sorry, of the innovation. So we are going to illustrate uh, frugal innovation in uh, this uh, course with some examples. Uh, first, we are going to make an introduction uh, about the concept, and then we are going to talk, talk about the six rules of uh, frugal innovation. And then uh, I will give you the assignment for uh, next week. So a radically different growth path. Frugal innovation is a choice that a company may take uh, and it will change definitely uh, his way of thinking about uh, innovation. So um, the, the concept of frugal innovation uh, was born in India uh, and uh, it lies in the concept of Jugad. I'm not, um, I don't know if I pronounce it well. Uh, Jugad uh, is, it's an Indie world word, uh, which means innovative solution, improvised, born from intelligence and ingenuity. So it, it reflects everything that is important in uh, frugality. It's an art, you know, it's more an art than a technique. It's the art of daring in the most disadvantageous conditions. And the pandemic is a good example of, um, of the Jugad um, because it, um, it has a uh, permits some uh, very, very interesting frugal innovation. Uh, in fact, Jugad is the art to find the most simple and sustainable solution. So frugal innovation, sustainability is at the, the core of frugal innovation. But it's not only in India that you can find frugal innovation. You can find it even in France, even in, in the States, in, in every, every country. But it was born in country where um, condi conditions are disadvantageous. Uh, so there is a world in uh, Brazil, Jetino, in Kenya, Juakali, in China, Zizu Chuangjin. Uh, sorry, again, for the accent. 
But um, you see, uh, you need to be frugal when you don't have anything, you know? So maybe it's uh, the disadvantage became an advantage that became an advantage because when you have nothing, you have to be clever, you have to be simple, you have to be fast, you have to be agile. Um, you cannot afford to be a big, a big machine. So the juga, this, this, this art of thinking simply, of, of uh, coping with uh, the disadvantage, um, is at the intersection of frugality, but also flexibility and and. A third concept that is often uh, for, forgotten, uh, inclusivity. Do not forget the inclusive part. It is almost the most important, which differentiates the Jugad from just a low-cost innovation. A low-cost innovation could only be frugal and flexible. The inclusivity part is um, the essence of, uh, of uh, the Jugad. The communities... Um, the poor ones, the bottom of but uh, the bottom of the pyramid ones, uh, must be concerned, must be included in the decisions. Uh, they are the heart of the ideas and the developments. So inclusivity, uh, the all type of minorities, is really the core of Jugad. So not only to be frugal and simple and flexible and agile, but to be inclusive. And we join Mike. Um, we can think about open innovation when you include uh, your customer, when you uh, think about it. Uh, in the Jugad, um, the customer is the core, uh, but every type of customer and usually forgotten customers. This is an example of the Jugad. It's the mythical. Uh, it's the very low cost, very frugal biodegradable refrigerator made out of clay. Uh, clay is not very a very new uh, material. So uh, the thing was to create a product uh, and a new industrial process with very, very limited uh, uh, education, engineering, limited capital and flexible thinking. Uh, flexible thinking, uh, thinking about uh, the fact that electricity was uh, quite uh, rare and uh, unstable. So uh, you couldn't, uh, it, it, it is, a, it is a, a product of India. So it, it was hard to have a regular refriger refrigerator because of uh, the scarce of electricity and its instability. So they decided to use a millennia old material like clay, uh, which was used uh, by the Egyptians to keep uh, the food, to keep the food uh, fresh and moisturized. Um, and this uh, nice uh, little refrigerator allows communities to have refrigerated produces such as uh, drinks, vegetables, and to keep it to keep them uh, longer. And also to have dairy, which is quite difficult when you don't have electricity. Um, and for, for have dairy for the first time, uh, and all of that in an environmentally friendly fashion. So interestingly, many users of the Mythicool, which is quite uh, strange, say that food actually tastes better when they are stored uh, in, uh, in it, in the Mythicool, compared as a regular fridge. Maybe because the regular fridge didn't work so well um, because of the so shortage of powers. But uh, they, they, they say that users say that it provides more moisture to the food. Uh, it didn't dry it out. So uh, it's, in fact, um, by making the more um, simple and uh, uh, simple product, uh, in fact, you make a better one. Sorry. Um, the pandemic uh, was uh, uh, a very good um, trial for the Jugad. Um, Juga that's been very useful during the pandemic. People had to find ways to keep on living in avoiding contacts and uh, in uh, earning very low incomes or no incomes at all. Uh, so it was unfortunately an, a good Jugad exercise to think about inclusive, frugal, flexible solution in a very um, unusual uh, environment very a new one. <laughs> um, so here is the, 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 the idea of a milkman also in India. 
Uh, so it's only a, it's only an idea. It's not a, a industrial process. But you can see that the milkman, uh, he's on his motorbike. And he, put, he has put a small pipe uh, and a funnel arrangement for giving milk by maintaining social distance. And he doesn't have to um, drop off the, the motorbike. He can stay on it. And he, he pour the milk in the funnel. And then um, it, uh, it, 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 <laughs> the milk goes by the pipe to uh, the recipient, to the customer. So now the, you can see that uh, the seller is trying to maintain social distance and is providing like a touch-free delivery system. And doing that is also improving his uh, delivery because it doesn't have to get on and off from the motorbike. So it's gaining some time. Um, it, so it, it's strange, but by uh, thinking a solution for one problem, social distancing, uh, he has uh, find uh, he has found a solution for another one. Time. So Jugad is the idea. It's a good head start, a bri brilliant idea in terms of creativity, uh, lateral thinking, uh, ingenuity. Uh, and even a good known problem area to start. The Jugad is the, um, really, I have a problem. I don't have anything to solve it, only my brain, only some old materials. And uh, what can I do? But you have, there is a step from the Jugad to the frugal innovation. To, to go from Jugad to frugal innovation, um, you have to, to think, you have to be an entrepreneur. You have to take the idea forward, forward to the next level. Um, you have to innovate further to make it um, sustainable, but in an industrial way. You have to think it from the cost, the process, the performance optimization, and uh, everything parallelly. So in frugal innovation, in fact, is the, it's the industrialization of the Juga. Uh, so the definition of frugal innovation is a practice, in fact, of rethinking the problem, rethinking every problem, and rethinking existing solutions to come up with uh, more sustainable, more low-cost, more reasonable, more inclusive, more flexible solution. Um, usually, a frugal innovation has more function than the functions than the uh, existing solution can be easily manufactured at scale, uh, cost less, uh, concern more customers, and concern more minorities that often uh, that are often forgotten from a uh, regular industrial process. So frugal innovation, it is about leveraging the limitations uh, in resources like financial, materials, or institutional, and by using a lot of methods um, and trying to turn these constraints, the lack of resources, into advantages. Uh, here is an example of uh, a frugal innovation in a very... Uh, uh, amazing way. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not a milkman on a motorbike. Like that. It's a. Uh, it's um, Mars orbiter uh, station uh, mission, Mangalyan, uh, coming from India, and India was the first country uh, with uh, having a Mars orbiter mission to successfully reach Mars, and uh, they use frugality to do it. So it's quite uh, paradoxical because I don't think that you will you will have think about um, space uh, space for frugality. Um, so what is uh, funny is that uh, um, um, Israel Mars mission, so, so the Mangalayan project, only uh, spend only <laughs> only spend seventy four million dollars uh, to reach um, to reach Mars. Uh, whereas uh, the the American one, Maven, uh, took six hundred and seventy million, so it's almost six hundred million, uh, yeah, six hundred million more, and we are talking about million. And what what is funny is that the movie Gravity had cost more than a Mangalayan mission, and uh, it didn't go to Mars. You know, one hundred million. So what uh, in the Israel uh, did uh, was uh, to minimize expenses through several innovation, 
um, uh, the first one was to use relatively small uh, rockets, um, very light, 33 pounds, compared to the 143 pounds of the Mavens. And the main innovation was to rely on the gravitational, gravitational force for the orbital movements of the rocket in space and to optimize it by a precise timing and power to reach closer in each revolution uh, instead of trying to reach it in the ideal position so and spend more time, in fact, in orbit. So they waited for the good time and they... Um, they um, they uh, they take uh, they they used the gravitational uh, force to be there at the right time and then to spend uh, less rockets to be put on. So in fact, they use uh, the <laughs> they use the technique into the gravity uh, movie. So it the, it was more clever. It costed less. They use uh, a lot of project members, but uh, they, they use project members, but only 40, 14. It was like a uh, one, 150 in the Maven project. So you can see that it's not uh, frugal doesn't mean not technical. It doesn't mean um, not um, not engi no engineering, no. No, it means that you have think about it in a very, very different way. You have seen, you have opened your eyes to a new dim dimension. So here is the Mangalayan project. So the business uh, model for frugal innovation includes uh, so a value proposition, proposition the, the value creation and the value capture. So uh, in terms of uh, proposition of value, um, you can sometimes uh, have like a no, no electricity, um, an, an affordable product, a niche product, um, the inc inclusion of uh, women empowerment, uh, an easy access, uh, a sustainable product. So you can see that sustainability is at the aim of the business model. Um, the capture value is to make profit on sales, uh, a little profits because it doesn't have to cost a lot, but on a big amount of sales because it includes all the minorities. And uh, you can create values in a model, uh, in frugal innovation by, by uh, as you have seen before, out-of-the-box thinking, uh, using of low-cost raw materials such as clay, uh, low-cost employees, not because they are bad employees, but because they are employees that usually are not employed, but have a lot of ideas, uh, low-cost products, simple technologies, uh, local supply chain, local employment, employment, so a lot of ideas to, to, to build a business model, a frugal business model. So now uh, we're going to talk about the six rule of uh, frugal innovation. And uh, each rule will be, um, will be enhanced by uh, an example. So the first rule, as you can have guessed yet, <laughs> was to think and act flexibly. Frugality is flexibility. Uh, you have to keep your mind open to be able to respond quickly to unexpected changes, such as a pandemic, but not only that. Unexpected, unexpected changes can be, um, like in the example I'm going to show you, can be uh, the way customers use the product, the product, which is not at all what we expected. And uh, the process to change needs to be fast, uh, in frugality, long term is not uh, a good term. You know, long term plans are dangerous because you have to be ready for unexpected. Unexpected. So here is the example of um, uh, Ayer, the home uh, appliance company. Ayer has uh, realized uh, the importance of consumer specificity to create a more suitable product. Um, you, they realized that the so it's higher in China, China, that the Chinese were using um, the washing machine to wash vegetables. It's strange, but it's true. Um, and uh, so um, maybe another company will have choose to, to create a new washing vegetables machine, but Aya didn't. He took the frugal side of the opportunity and um, they decided to create a washing machine with two types of pipe, one bigger than the other one, 
uh, the bigger pipe for the vegetables and the little uh, the, the bigger part for the for the for the clothes and the a little pipe for the vegetables so that the vegetables won't go in the pipe so you you have the same washing machine and you can choose which pipe will be used so um, instead of trying to sell two products uh, they respect their customers uh, and they respect their need uh, to have um, a useful uh, machine and uh, not to have the money to have two machines so they make it more frugal and now it's a, a washing a washing clothes and vegetable machine so you have to be flexible to do that second of all keep it simple um, frugal frugal uh, is a frugal lies in uh, simplicity um, the, the aim is not to to create the perfect product is to create a good enough product solution easy to use easy to use and to maintain satisfying a wider audience more affordable more sustainable and with all that even the good enough product is is the better one you know so here uh, is the, an example of general electric and the v-scan which is a portable ultrasound machine compact easy to use as as a cell phone so everyone everybody in the world can use a cell phone but not everyone can use a v uh, a scan, but this one is very, uh, very easily transported in every remote area, easy to use, even for non-initiated person, even for non-medical uh, person. It's simple, it's light, it's cheap, there is no maintenance. Um, you know, usually we, we, we could have a, a thing that GE will have built um, a, a, a more a big machine with a lot of options, uh, in order to make people pay more, because if they make a, v a sport portable V scan, uh, it would be like very expensive. It will have a lot of options and like a, a new iPhone. But no, they they tr they decided to to make it very very simple. Only four buttons, ready to use for everyone, very cheap, and they sell it a lot. <laughs> so everything is possible, even if General Electric is doing it. Include the margin, so include the minority, recognizing the diversity of consumer needs in merging marketing. Uh, don't think that what um, happened in Western rich country happened everywhere. And even in Western rich country, don't think that every consumer has the same needs. Every consumer wants to reach the, the, um, the top of the pyramid. No, people have uh, specific needs. Um, and yeah, it, the, it's refusing to deal only with the majorities, only with the, the power to pay, you know, uh, including the marginal groups in the reflection to co-create value as an open innovation, creating an inclusive work culture, in fact, also. Uh, here is an example. It's, um, it's an app, Pay in Yami, uh, for the 24% of Americans without debit or credit card. So it's almost like a transfer found, but without uh, an account. Uh, you only have to uh, make a little deposit and uh, you don't have to, to have a debit or a credit card, um, which is quite um, an astonishment for me. 24, uh, one of four Americans doesn't have debit or credit card. So it's a company that includes this, uh, the, those people who cannot afford um, to have credit card but who can? Who, uh, but they need to pay, and they include them in the. Uh, they make a product for them, so including the margin. Follow your heart. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, frugal is uh, gut innovation. You know, it's the the relying on your gut intelligence, on your empathy, on your feelings. Um, here uh, is the example. Um, of Big Bazaar, uh, it's an Indian uh, retail store um, who was created without any management or marketing study, only the feeling from its creator that Indian people wanted to feel, um, didn't like retail store, uh, Western retail store, you no know, uh, um, clear and, and uh, uh, I don't know, um, 
like like you can uh, you can see them uh, people wanted to feel like in a bazaar in a retail store like uh, to to feel the smell the chaos and the uh, the um, debating about price and and so on they didn't try to replicate western modern um, of retail they follow their heart and it became the largest retail chain in india so it was a success follow your gut do more with less uh, that's the point um, the point uh, here you can enhance on the sustainability because the, the aim is to optimize um, the use of scarce resources uh, while delivering high value to more customers so you don't um, you take into account that the resources are scarce but um, you deal with it you avoid reinventing the wheel you reuse old technology like clay networks uh, local chain supplies and you being sustainable in every way even a company like pepsico <laughs> try it uh, in fact pepsico um, you, you have to uh, they they use a lot of water to make uh, the pepsi and uh, they decided, um, and they, there is water shortage in India, in some parts of India, um, and uh, they decided to uh, become um, to become water uh, positive. Uh, so they couldn't um, they couldn't uh, reduce the amount of water they used to produce Pepsi. But what they could do is help farmer to spend less water in. Um, in cultivating, cultivating the rice. So they uh, have decided to help the farmer to spend less water while cultivating this rice with uh, the use of the technique of direct sowing, uh, which is a type of sowing who use less letter than the regular one. It's a very old, um, old type. And it, it, uh, it's amazing that in one year, it had saved uh, 7 billion uh, liters of water, and now Pepsi is uh, water positive in India. Its, act its activities uh, uh, spend less water than they make it gain from the farmer. So it could be the same everywhere <laughs> when you think about it. And last uh, but not least, uh, you have to seek opportunities even in adversity. Uh, you have to transform adversity into an opportunity to innovate, to bring value to an organization or a community. In fact, you have to see uh, the glass half full instead of half empty. Uh, an example here is the Suzlan uh, wind power company in India. Uh, at the beginning, Tenti, the creator of Suzlan, wanted to create a textile manufacturer in India, but he was confronted with the lack of electricity and the shortage of electricity. So, so he, th he, sorry, he thought about uh, using power groups, but power groups needed fuel or gas and were also in shortages. So he decided for wind power. So he decided to use wind power to make a textile manufacturer. W wind power is very, very abundant, abundant in, in India and everywhere, in fact. And uh, by by uh, thinking about using wind power, he began to build <laughs> wind power uh, uh, things. I don't know the term, sorry. And um, he forget about textile and he became the fifth provider of wind power in the world. So an opportunity, adversity leads to an opportunity and leads to become a giant in, uh, in the energy uh, department. So um, I, I hope that you have seen that uh, frugality is the future of innovation in a very adverse world. Uh, I don't think that it's a I don't say that it's the future of uh, every innovation, but as the environment does uh, uh, does not uh, improve a lot, um, I think that frugality is um, the only way. Uh, every country could keep on going uh, while innovating, while answering uh, the needs of consumers, while uh, taking into account, uh, account diversity, while being sustainable. So I hope all these examples have triggered your frugal vibe and, um, and you will need it for uh, this assignment, a very, very easy assignment, because um, for the end of this uh, 
courses, uh, you have to make a project. So in order to do that for next time, by groups, uh, next time I will uh, make like take five minutes maybe to answer your question about frugality and about the video. Don't uh, hesitate to watch it again because I'm speaking quite fast. Uh, so for the next time with your uh, constituted groups, uh, maybe in five minutes, I don't know, uh, you have to answer three questions. First, uh, it's a very personal question, but you have to be... Uh, uh, to agree in your group, what is the most important innovation in the 21st century? I say 21st, not uh, 21st century. Um, then I would like you to think about uh, the domain where you would like to innovate for your project. <coughs> and then I would like you to think about an idea of frugal or uh, open innovation or end open innovation, uh, maybe to solve a problem you have uh, already or always wanted to solve. Maybe you have all ideas from I don't know where. Or if you don't have any idea, maybe uh, take an existing innovation and add frugality uh, to it. Maybe something you think you think about some, an innovation and you say, oh, it could be more frugal. So these three uh, questions, so I, I, I don't need an expose of uh, no, only five minutes talking about that. Uh, it could be, it, it is a good starting point for your project. So be pragmatic, be simple, obviously be frugal, be sustainable, be inclusive. Uh, and uh, I, I enjoy, uh, I'm, I'm glad, <laughs> sorry, I'm glad to see you next week. Bye-bye.